in the early 60s. Um, I started practicing in 1964 at Sokoji, San Francisco. And I was living there at the time. And then um, after a year or so, I moved to Berkeley. And uh, there was um, uh, a little group in Berkeley of students of Suzuki Roshi. And they would have a um, so was, um, um, uh, Monday morning zazen and breakfast and lecture. Suzuki Roshi would come over. And um, that was very intimate and nice, but it kind of went from one person's house to another. And um, then uh, when um, I think Suzuki Roshi kind of knew that I would like to, you know, find a place. So he uh, asked me after uh, uh, we had a lecture, and after the lecture, he asked me if I would um, find a place, you know, for the group. So I did, and it was a place on Dwight Way. It was quite a um, uh, big place, you know, and then uh, old. But the f uh, important feature about it was that it had an, an unfinished attic. And um, the attic was square, and it, and it came out to a, the four uh, corners came out to a point in the roof. Um, so it had its advantages and disadvantages. <laughs> But um, it was wonderful because all the way around the bottom was open, and uh, so I put a, little sc a screen there, but you, you could see the light, you know. So it was a uh, wonderful zendo, but very steep stairs, very uncode. But uh, at first we sat in the dining room, in the, in the living room, and then uh, we fixed up the, um, uh, the zendo, which I always wanted to do, and made, we fixed up the attic and made it into a zendo. And I remember scrounging stuff, scrounging boards, and you know, I, n I never had any money in those days, and um, uh, I was always, you know, a kind of scrounger anyway. So <laughs> I fit in perfectly to the pattern, <laughs> monk's pattern. And um, I remember finding a huge piece of plywood on the freeway, you know, and stopping and picking it up, and putting it on the car, and bringing it over to the zendo. So. And a lot of people worked on the, the, the floor, you know, which was fur, very splintery and kind of open and old. And, and we just worked all those boards, you know, into a smooth um, uh, floor. And um, people loved the Zendo. It was really quite nice. So, and then little by little, um, we developed a practice there. And I was a caretaker. You know, I saw my role as a caretaker. And, but, you know, we had morning zazen, which was uh, the beginning. And, of course, I was there, so I was taking care of it. And um, I was taking care of the house. And so I was, you know, considered the leader of the group. And we had uh, five month, five dollars a month dues, which I kept in a little... Um, uh, tobacco can, a Balkan Sobrani can, kind of round, and I still have the can. <laughs> Our first bank. <laughs> so um, then I asked Suzuki Roshi, I said, well, is it okay to have afternoon zazen? Because I always submitted to him. And uh, he said, uh, yeah, you can do whatever you want. So we had afternoon zazen and kind of felt free to you know, to uh, build up the practice. And I, um, we had a re really large yard in the back. And so I decided that I would make it into a vegetable garden. So I spent years out there, you know, developing the, that vegetable garden and um, put in a gray water system and composting. And, and I, my ideal, you know, was to, um, be, be around at this, at this, and, and talk to people and help them and work on the garden. And I would talk to people if they came by, you know, in the garden. And it was really quite idyllic. How do people find out about it? Well, I don't know. 
will make one more change. Yeah, yeah. do you think you can go in um, once in a while? Or you can go? Okay. Right, okay. Okay, we're all set. We're all set? So how did... So this is right at the height of the organic gardening movement. Oh, when you were working in the, in the garden? Yeah, so I was all, you know, I'd go out and I'd get uh, clippings from the street, you know, and put, and put them into the compost. And so um, uh, that's the way I, I kind of saw my practice and, and practicing with people. And, and to have a local zendo where people could, you know, local people could practice. It sounds like you look upon those years as... It sounds oh, like fondly. Very fondly. And I built up the library by um, having people donate books, which I would take to Moe's, turn in for trade. And then I, you know, and that's how I learned about um, uh, Buddhist literature. And I knew all the books that were in the library. And uh, I studied and uh, built up the library that way. So it was. Uh, it was all on the cheap, you know. We paid one hundred and thirty dollars a month rent for this huge place. So, how do people find out about it? I don't know. Just word of mouth. We never advertised anywhere. Yeah, we never have. When you think about when you think about being there, what are your memories of? Do you remember? Was there anything that stands out? Maybe around um, the attic and sitting up there and. What was the atmosphere like up there when you were sitting? Well, um, you know, any room can become a zendo. And when it's, when you put the altar in and you put the cushions down, <laughs> you know, and you, it becomes a zendo and it's all beautiful, you know. And then when you take it all out, it's just a room, you know. So it's very interesting about space. And I love the space because it was square. I think square is really a great um, space for a zendo. And also, you know, people were just learning how to sit in those days. We didn't have a lot of, you know, people who, who could sit well and who had years of practice. So uh, both the Berkeley zendo and San Francisco at that time, people were just having these uh, um, uh, uh, physical and spiritual dramas, you know, working them out, you know, a lot of pain, a lot of, you know, soul searching. <laughs> and so the, uh, people loved it, you know, they loved that, that Zendo. And so there was, when we had to leave, it was just, you know, really wrenching. I never wanted to leave. I wanted to buy the place. But the landlord kept, very, very slick guy, and he kept, Upping the upping the ante, you know, upping upping. I mean, it was always going out of reach. So that's when I started looking for another place. I said there was a pickle jar there, or is it <laughs> pickle what, jar, was it, or or some kind of um, I don't know if it was cucumbers or do you remember? That? Somebody told me a story about some kind of um, anyway. There's what happened? There was a, I don't know. There was just this big. Um, it was a large container of, um, I thought it was pickles. Maybe I'm... Maybe. Maybe, uh, okay. Well, I, I don't remember it. Yeah, okay. Well, well, how did it relate to the, I mean, this was the 60s, right? So... Yeah, it was the time of the of the uh, riots in, uh, up on Telegraph. Yeah. And um, all that stuff was going on at the same time. And I can remember, you know, uh, somebody racing through the backyard and climbing over the fence. <laughs> And someone in hot pursuit. Some, I, I guess it was a cop. I'm not sure. <laughs> but that was all going on up there, you know. And we were kind of doing our thing, and uh, um, this is kind of simultaneously going on. And um, um, when you also. Did you, were you starting a family at that time, or were you um, well, at, at um, Dwight Way? Was, um, what was going on in your, your my, life at that time? Well, that's where I, I, I met my wife, because we had a, um, uh, there was a house up uh, about a mile, I can't, what street is that? Henry 
It's not good. It's not good. Yeah. Oh, that guy's hammering. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, it's, we're going to have to go. You know, there's nothing to do to control it, so. Well, maybe just do it in between hammer blows. Yeah, I think that's what we'll do. Anyway, we had a house nearby, and uh, uh, five or six Zen students lived in the house. And uh, my wife was one of them. And uh, um, so she would, come, she would come to Zazen with them. And actually, there's still people who are living in that house then who are practicing here now. <laughs> Besides my wife, <laughs> who's not practicing now, but um, uh, so then um, that's kind of where I, where we got together. Yeah. Um, so you, you were talking about your role as sort of caretaker. People didn't see you as a teacher. Or they, well, they or... did, but I always told them that I wasn't. I said, I'm, I'm not really the teacher, you know. But I, I said, if, if I can, I'll help you in any way I can, but I'm not, I'm not officially the teacher. So I just, you know, um, ha did what I could for people. And uh, so in some way I was de facto the teacher, but I never proclaimed myself as a teacher. Matter of fact, I didn't proclaim myself as a teacher until 1984, when I had Dharma transmission. And up until that time, of course, you know, 67 is when we opened the Zendo. So um, I grew, grew into the, you know, role. But you were ordained, though. I was ordained in 69, right. So, and it was Suzuki Roshi ordained me at the Zendo. He just tried to decide whether or not to ordain me at Zen Center, Tazahara, or at uh, the Zendo. And he said he would do it at the Zendo. Um, in order to promote, you know, my position at the Zendo. And uh, that's when I felt more freedom to do things. But still, I didn't proclaim myself as a teacher. And, but people say, well, are you I said, well, if, if um, I teach you something, then I'm a teacher. That's all. If you feel that, you know, you're, you're getting something from me. But I don't proclaim myself as a teacher. And I didn't do that until 84 when I had Dharma transmission. So I was very careful. Which I think is good for people, good for other teachers to do. <laughs> and Suzuki Roshi would, would come over? Yeah, he would come over. Yeah, we kind of continued the Monday morning thing. But then Tassahara began, was founded in 67, the same year as. Um, we found the Z founded the Zendo, and um, so uh, after a while, his visits became less because he ha had to take care of Tassahara as well as the city. And then Katagiri Roshi would come over on Monday, and then um, Shino Sensei would come over, and Yoshimura was another priest that was there at the time. So we had. Uh, four priests, four Japanese priests. Uh, uh, three of them were helping Suzuki Roshi. And we really uh, enjoyed those priests. You know, each one was different. And they all had some different uh, character and different way of offering the, the teaching. And um, they were all very kind and very, you know, wonderful people. So I was very fortunate to have that group of priests, you know, to. Uh, um, in my life. Did you have sashins there? Did you have sashins? Did you? Did well, you, did um, you know, we used to go to San Francisco for sashin. We did have sash We had short sittings, you know, like one day or something. But for sashins, we went to to um, uh, San Francisco. I just I insisted on that that we participate because we were an affiliate originally of San Francisco Zen Center. So um, I felt that we should participate, you know, with, and with Suzuki Roshi, you know. And even after Suzuki Roshi died, 71, I still didn't do that until I had, um, still went to San Francisco for Sushi until I had Dharma transmission in 84. 
I mean, we may have had some sashins here before that, but I, I'm not clear on that. I can't remember. But that's when I started. I felt that I was, you know, um, after Dharma transmission, that I was sanctioned to actually be a teacher. It sounds like the Berkeley Center evolved over a period of it, did yeah. it evolve? I mean, evolved. How did did you how did it change over the um, over the years? Did you Well it was the first place in, at Dwight Way we there was an upstairs and a downstairs in the attic. And I lived on the uh, downstairs with my wife and then um, a couple of people lived in the attic. I mean I was gonna in the basement, <laughs> you know, the bottom floor. And um, some of those people are still practicing here. Um, uh, and so it wasn't really a residential practice, although there were people who lived in the house next door, sometimes across the street, you know. So, uh, you know, the way that we moved here is um, that um, because I, I had a feeling that the owner would never sell the place to us, even though it, we loved it. We all loved it. Uh, we were there 12 years. Um, but I decided that we really wanted to have our own place. And I didn't know how to do that. We had no money, nothing. And um, so I, you know, I had been invited to an EST training. Um, he had invited uh, psychologists and spiritual leaders, and I was one of those people who got invited. <laughs> So I went through the S thing, and but what he did was charge two hundred dollars, and that was a lot of money in those days. You know, wow, two hundred dollars to go to the wow. And I thought, well, if he can do that, I could ask people for to the sangha for two hundred dollars each, right? So we had a meeting and said, you know, I wanted to look for a place, and uh, we asked uh, for two hundred dollars from everybody. I think that what I did. I can't remember when I did that first or second, but I rode my bike up and down all the streets of Berkeley looking for a place. It took months and months, you know, just going up and down the street on my bike. Like I, I, I was very familiar with every place, in, <laughs> at least in the lowlands. And then one day, one of our members knew the person that owned this place. And she said, he would be, you know, willing to sell it to you, you know. I think that's when we started to do the fundraising. So we got this, you know, big push, and not everybody gave two hundred dollars. Some people gave more, but everybody gave something, you know, and, and and made an effort to really put out. And that kind of generated a um, um, an effort on everybody's part. And then we just continued to raise funds, and then people loaned us money, with no, you know, with no, uh, uh, a lot of trust. And uh, the owner turned over the loan to us, which he wasn't supposed to do legally, but he did. And so we just, you know, went with that. <laughs> and I wanted the rents to pay for the mortgage and stuff like that. So pretty much, you know, we've always been okay, you know. Um, we finally paid off the place one, two years ago, last year. And uh, that's a remarkable. And we never really had debt, you know. And I think, you know, I don't know anything about money. So I think that's why everything worked so well. <laughs> it also seemed like people were very um, committed to this place. He's very committed. What was, that, what, was that, what was that commitment coming from? Well, you know, um, uh, people found their uh, confidence in Zazen, you know. And, and they really felt that it was a... Uh, a commitment. They had a commitment to zazen and a commitment to the practice, and um, you know it's a it's a transient population. You know, you give zazen instruction to ten people, and nobody returns. You know, on, on a Saturday, so every week. But you know, then uh, a couple of people stay and start practicing. You know, so over a period of time, a number of people stay and start practicing. But most people, they're just passing through. And then those people that stay for a while, some of them pass through, 
stay a while, and but some of them are, connect with the practice. So you don't know who's going to connect with the practice. And it's not a big practice because uh, uh, it's not easy, you know? And a person has to be ready for it. I mean, you can't convince your spouse to come and do that, you know, because she may not be ready for it. It's not like a uh, devotional practice where all you have to do is, you know, be devoted. But it is a devotional practice, and you have to be really devoted to the practice, you know, to really stay there. To, and, it's, and the practice comes up against you. And so, you know, you find places where it's really hard to get through. But if you stay with that, and then you make, become successful, then your confidence grows and your understanding grows, and uh, makes it much more... And then your your faith grows. So it seems like you had a real committed core of folks who are still practicing today, right? Yes. And you know, uh, it wasn't always like that. I mean, I can remember times when there were three or four people in the Zendo, you know, in the morning. <laughs> uh, but now, I mean, over a period, I think it really started, the core of practice started getting this this strong, I don't know, five or ten years ago, ten years ago or something, you know. I think probably after um, I had my Dharma transmission, 84. It sounds like that that also... Well, that was a big affected, event. ...affected you, too. Huh? It, it, something changed with you as well. Yeah, well, yeah, that's, that's right, yeah. And, you know, installing me as abbot, that's a big ceremony. And so it, it kind of gave, gave a boost to the practice. So, um, it's just a, uh, and pe people just have confidence in the practice, you know. From their experience. But, yeah, but they earn it, you know. <laughs> and... Uh, going through their difficulties and, and dealing with that, you know, and, and uh, that strengthens their practice. Talk a little bit about the, um, the development of the forms and the, and mm. the chanting. And, yeah. uh, there's, a, there's a certain structure to the, to the practice that... Um, talk about where that, where that came from and right. how that was developed. Um, starting, I would imagine, starting at Dwight Way and then well, I think you have to start in China. <laughs> I mean, I mean, because um, you know the Chinese practice is somewhat formal, but the Japanese practice is very formal. You know, the Japanese um, uh, society is is a formal society, and uh, um, the forms, you know, became very important in how you how you structure your practice and your life. So uh, Japanese practice being very formal, um, this is what we inherited. I didn't make it up, you know. And what was brought to us by Suzuki Roshi and our other teachers from Japan was just the bare essentials of formal practice. Bowing, bowing when you come into Zendo, keep, you know, the Zendo having its, uh, its own uh, space uh, relationships and the way it's constructed, and, um, you know, ex excessive bowing, you know. It's like, but this bowing uh, to everything is like, it looks like a formal practice, but actually when you um, uh, absorb it, when you totally enter into it, it's not formal. So it's only formal when you, from the outside, because it's what it is. Every time you bow, you're letting go and allowing a fresh moment to arise. So it's, it's not, you know, if people are not, don't understand that, then it just looks like kind of like, you know, a little doll going, bobbing up and down. <laughs> but it's actually um, uh, uh, quite wonderful practice. So we do a lot of bowing, and the chanting, you know, is, is uh, the one, the one 
chant that uh, is done in, in Buddhism, in all the, all the schools of Buddhism, is uh, it, it, most of the schools, Mahayana Buddhism, uh, is the Heart Sutra, Prajna Paramita Sutra, which talks about form and emptiness. Form is emptiness, emptiness is form. So it's a sutra of non-duality and a sutra of um, form and em uh, the, re the relationship of form and emptiness and actually the non-duality of form and emptiness. You mentioned also that um, the reason why these forms are important was that it, it helps create a container, I guess. Would, the yes. Is that right? Is, could you talk a little bit about yeah, that? It not only creates a container, but it, can cre it creates an atmosphere. So when you walk in off the street, you, you, as soon as you enter the gate, you, you, you're, um, because of the atmosphere of the place, uh, you start letting go of the, the street and entering into the atmosphere of the place. And uh, then when you walk in the door, you bow, and you're letting go more and more, <laughs> shedding, shedding your stuff more and more. And, and then uh, by the time you get to the cushion, you know, you're ready to let go. So, um, uh, the structure helps to create an atmosphere of practice and the chanting and all that. So it's a kind of, it's a kind of little drama, you know. But it's a, it's a useful drama in that it, it prepares your mind and you can recognize, you can say, oh, this is Zen practice, you know. So you, you behave in a certain way. When you go outside the gate, then where's the Zen practice, you know. So you have to take uh, all the forms that you meet when you leave and turn them into forms of practice. So it's just the opposite way. When you say when you come in, you're letting go, what are you, what are you letting go? Well, you're letting go of your opinions and your, and your, you know, the stuff you've been thinking about. But I mean, you don't really let go, but you make an effort to let go. <laughs> Even though, you know, you sit down and all starts coming up. But... Um, even though uh, all your th your um, thoughts and attachments are coming up, ideas and desires, um, you can sit with it and let it and let it come up and let it go without attaching to it. So were these were these taught to you? I mean, were, was the, the in terms of the, the forms and the, and the, um, and. The, practices. Was that taught to you by Suzuki Roshi? Or no, it's just, it's, it's but I, or when I, yeah, it's just established. So when you, when I entered the Zendo, you know, the first time, it was a little mysterious, you know, over at uh, Sokoji, actually, San Francisco, and uh, just this bare room with the tatamis, you know, and an altar. And so I sat down, and a little old man came along and adjusted my posture, you know, and and I was just there, you know, with a, and it just felt very wonderful. And then they, we all got up and started bowing, and that was very strange, you know. <coughs> but we just enter into it, you know. So nobody ever taught any, I never got taught anything. You know, people, the priests, you know, they say, well, will you teach me how to do the service? Will you teach? I never was taught how to do anything. You just learn by uh, participation, by observation. So and that's the Japanese way. Yeah, like, uh, you know, Suzuki Roshi say, would say, your teacher will never teach you everything. You know, just enough f to help you um, keep going. Well, America is very unique because when the, our teachers, Suzuki Roshi and um, Maizumi Roshi and uh, all the teachers, but Suzuki Roshi, I think, was first. Um, a very unique person. And he didn't impose Japanese ishness on us. He didn't expect us like a lot of teachers would. Um, uh, and he saw us as we were, and he really felt that we were very innocent. And and you know he liked the fact that we didn't know anything. So uh, and that he could work with us without baggage. And so he, uh, because there were men and women wanting to practice. He accepted that. And because there were lay people who wanted to practice, he accepted that. So he just went with what came to him, right?
He didn't try to do anything. He simply worked with the people that came to him, and they were lay people. Of course, there weren't any priests. How could there be any priests, right? Since he didn't ordain them. <laughs> Nobody was there to ordain them. So everybody was a lay person, and we had this wonderful lay practice at Sokoji, the first temple. Everybody was a lay person, except a few people that he'd sent to Japan in the early days to Eheji, to monastery, to practice, but that never worked out very well. And most of them left, but a couple of them were ordained. But it didn't amount to much in the uh, history. Um, so, um, uh, it, you know, when we, at Sokoji, when I came there, the men were sitting on one side of the zendo, and the women were sitting on the other side. And uh, when we got up, uh, we'd turn around, and the men and women would bow to each other. <laughs> and then we'd have service, you know, which is very simple. And uh, uh, that was wonderful. I, I just, it just felt wonderful for the men and the women to acknowledge each other as men and women, <laughs> you know, separate. And, and bow to each other as a kind, as like a kind of acknowledgement, which we never have, you know. And then somebody said, well, you know, it's America, and we should all be sitting together, and blah, blah, blah. And so everybody started sitting together, and I, and I felt that it just, something was lost in that, you know. Some respect was lost in that, putting it all together. So, and Suzuki Roshi, you know, he felt that... Uh, when, when a, a man is a man and a woman is a woman, they're equal. They shouldn't try to be, you know, women shouldn't try to be men and men shouldn't try to be, men should be men and women should be women, you know, whatever they are. And then they can respect each other and they're equal, totally equal. So that, for him, that was equality. And so a lot of people had trouble with that, as you can imagine, in that day and age. Um, and so I really liked the lay practice, and he did too, because Suzuki Roshi, although he practiced at Eheji, his life practice was as a, as a temple priest, taking care of lay people, the danka, you know. And at some point in the Meiji period in Japan, the, uh, the priests were turned out of the monasteries, and they had to um, take care of temples. And so they were, they were allowed to marry, have families, and so the temple system developed. And then everyone had to register with a temple. So you had these family registrations with temples. And the tradition from the Meiji period, around 1850 or 60, um, time of the Civil War, um, the, the practice developed in that way. So a lot of lay people. And so the priests, though, became more like um, pastors and the, all, of the, all the temples had zendos, nobody was sitting in them, which is the case today, except here and there, a little bit. So um, when Suzuki Roshi came here, well, he was used to lay people, and, and uh, you know, he was very happy that they all wanted to sit zazen, <laughs> which is, you know, very different. So he just put up with the problems, you know, and, to, and helped us develop the problem. And, and we have all the problems that go with that. You know, problems of family, children, wives, husbands, um, uh, men and women practicing together, you know, sex, all this stuff, you know. Uh, but, you know, um, and it's still going on, the development. I don't know how it will ever develop, but I think it's, this is the way it is, and it's not going to change. So this is the way it's in America. It's not the same in Japan. No, it's not, in this Japan. Is uniquely it's uniquely American. Uniquely American. And it, now it's uniquely European. We have lay people practicing Zazen. Yeah. Um, yeah. That, that's their practice. Yeah, that's right. And for lay people to get up in the morning and do this, you know, it's very unique practice. And to participate. My idea was that it would be a grassroots Zendo. That's what I had thought about a grassroots Zendo. We didn't ask, you know, rich people for money. I wanted us to, to um, uh, have us supported ourselves, and and uh, put the energy into it, doing that, and and that the the zendo would grow out of our own uh, desire to do something, and that's what the way it's been going. That's what's happened. So uh, we never had any debts, and we never were indebted to anybody, you know, 
and uh, nobody could tell us what to do because they gave us a lot of money. And there were, some people did give us some money, but mostly the uh, money has come from members. Uh, all of our supports come from members. And um, uh, so we grapple with these problems, you know. And I remember at the, uh, there was a um, Dogen conference in at Palo Alto a couple, number of years ago. And I gave a talk, and one of the things I said was that I talked about our, you know, practice in America, and I said, um, when you have uh, non when you have celibate practice, there are problems. When you have non celibate practice, there are problems. You just have to choose which problems you're going to deal with, <laughs> you know, because whichever way it goes, you're going to have problems. So we've chosen the non celibate way, but we have problems with it. But you know. I don't think that the problems are any any more than the problems with celibate practice. If you want to look at the Catholic Church, that's an example. I don't want to say that. To me. But that's what appeals. <laughs> Cut that's, that out. <laughs> that's what appeals to me about these practices, or that's why I'm here, is because I can practice here as a layperson. That's right. That's yeah. why. I'm, that's you why don't I'm have here. to become a priest. That's exactly right. You know when. When um, I became, when I uh, had my uh, mountain seat ceremony, which is abbot installation, then I could um, ordain people. And, uh, you know, I'd always admired um, the people who were really into practice, lay people. But those are the people that wanted to be ordained as priests. And I didn't really want to ordain them as priests because I, th I wanted them to be good examples of lay practice. And I thought if I ordained them as priests, then um, uh, where will the examples of lay practice be? Everybody will want to be ordained as a priest. So that was a dilemma for me. I finally ended up doing that, and it's okay. But it's still, you know, it's a little rocky. You know, should I be a priest? You know. Uh, a priest is a way of life. It's not a position. You know. It's not something you, you can come up to. You know, it's a, for as a reward or something. It's for, not like a job. Yes. Yeah. It's like being, you know, a servant. That's what I tell people. You know, if you want to be a priest, that means you want to be a servant. So you have to serve the sangha. That's your that's your role, serving them. Because the, you know, like in Southeast Asia, many places in the world, the monks are you know put on a platform. The lay people sit down below, and the lay people feed the monks. The monks are kind of helpless, you know, in that they can't feed themselves. But so it, it, it's wonderful, you know. It's it's a it's a symbiotic relationship between the lay people and the the monks teach the lay people, and they do stuff for them, you know, and they maintain the practice and so forth. And the lay people, in turn, feed them and make sure that they're taken care of. But in our practice, not like that. You know, everybody contributes the same way, and everybody practices the same way. Uh, and so the priests' uh, function is to, to serve the sangha and, and take care of the, you know, no matter how many transients come or go, the priests are there as the solid foundation, even though lay people are too, but that's the priest's role. And then the priests can, um, uh, you know, should have monastic practice and uh, um, prepare themselves to, you know, if they um, qualify to have Dharma transmission and become a teacher somewhere. But we also have lay teachers, because, and, and that's something that I'm beginning to recognize, is, is to, rec to have lay teacher recognition. It's not Dharma transmission, because I think that's for priests, but it's lay teacher recognition. And I give them a, 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 a green rock so in a certificate. Um, and uh, what they're qualified to do. 
because there are people, there are lay people, you know, who are good models and good and can teach the Dharma and practice just like a priest, you know, practice exemplary way, you know, and and just the example itself is enough. It's not like they teach sutras or, you know, something like that academically, but just their behavior and their demeanor and the, and their understanding of practice inspires other people. That's enough. And that's what I, I would think that is, I don't know if it's uniquely Zen, but it's, um, and I, I've heard people often talk about um, Suzuki Roshi that way, and that was, it's the way a person holds, the way the teacher holds a teacup, the way yeah. the person right. walks down the street, the way, the way that's, that's what we're talking about. Deportment, the yeah, deportment, proper deportment. The, Dignity, the, um, those kinds they of carry things. the practice, you know. They carry the practice with them. Yeah. But they carry it, in, I and mean, you talked about it today, in the little things that they do in their life. Let's talk yeah. about that a little bit. I mean, that's I mean, that's what you're, in terms of um, how we're uh, evolving the practice, or how 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 it mm-hmm. practice is evolved within a person, mm-hmm. is how they present themselves. In their mm-hmm. life, in the little, I mean, just in how they carry themselves. I mean, That's right. You know, like Soto Zen practice is very careful practice and very uh, attention to detail, attention to small things. I remember one time um, somebody gave Suzuki Roshi, a, brought, brought a, a cup from Japan, gave it to him. And we were this, this circle of people, and he was passing it around. And when he, he came to me, he said, I was holding it up. He said, "Don't hold it like that." He said, "Put your hand on the ground, on the floor, so that the cup has no chance of falling." That's kind of that example. Take he was always berating me, you know, about <laughs> taking care of things, <laughs> being careful. Yeah. That's mindfulness, I guess. It's mindfulness so and 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 and. Uh, being um, mindfulness and, and and appreciation for things, you know, don't drag the don't drag the the uh, chair across the floor. Pick up the chair and put it down. I mean, you know, when we first got Page Street, the zendo was underneath the the um, the dining room, which is unusual. He said, "Okay, but <laughs> it's unusual to have the the zendo below the dining room." But and so people get up from eating and drag the chairs across the floor, you know. You can hear it down the center. These don't drag the chairs. It wasn't not just because of that, but because there's the floor, you know. You should appreciate the, the, the nature of the floor and what the chair is doing to the floor and what the floor is doing to the chair and what you're doing with the chair and what you're doing with things. You're holding the teacup, you should um, put it down on the floor like with your hand on the bottom and holding the cup so that it doesn't have a chance to fall any place. Yeah. That's in that, and that, what was that an example of? An example of um, uh, taking the utmost precaution. You know, not, not, not thinking that you have it. I do that a lot. You know, I think, oh, I have it, you know, and then I drop it, right? <laughs> so it's... it's uh, um, uh, real care for things. I was reading um, somebody's, you know, the people are going to Japan every once in a while. The, the, the Soto Shu invites people who've had Dharma transmission to come to Japan to do a little practice period there. And this woman was talking about um, when she was there, I, I think it was last year or the year before, and how kind the monks were to her and how kind they were to each other. And she said she was going through this excruciating, you know, they have hour-long periods of zazen, and so the most excruciating, you know, um, uh, zazen, she's, and she'd been practicing for years and years. And, and she said she was, there was this one period where, you know, she, could, she had to curl up because it was so painful. And at that point, somebody tapped her on the shoulder and said, come on. And she thought, oh, they're going to take me to this room and beat me. <laughs> And, she, and he said, your bath is ready. So she <laughs> sent her to the bath. 
<laughs> but the, as far as the altar, you know, I, I learned this from Suzuki Roshi, um, that um, the altar, he didn't say this, but I, you know, but the, the altar is, is like represents our practice. And when you're sitting zazen, you know, you're uh, balancing and, and um, sitting up straight and aligning all of the parts of your body, you know. And that's what you do when you sit zazen. You just keep aligning, working at aligning all the parts of your body. So the altar is a kind of representative of that. And so there's a way of um, putting the objects on the altar so that they all relate to each other and they all have their own space. And each one has its own space and is related to all the other parts which each have their own space. So it's like a harmonious, you know, when you look at the altar, when it's done that way, it's very harmonious. And then there's the Buddha's nose, and then the middle, the, and then that intersects the um, uh, incense burner. And then you line up the other incense burner on these diagonal, on these, on these um, cross um, lines. <clears throat> and, you know, when I go to the altar, I look, I look at that every time, <laughs> and I say, oh, this is off. And I put it back, you know, every single time, almost. You know, the person has, bless their heart, not been aware, you know. I think, I tell it, how can I not be aware? But I, I have to let go of that, and I just <laughs> don't blame but I just move it over, and then people say, he's so fussy, you know, he's really fussy. <laughs> but I also I remember when I first started sitting, and, um, and I still struggle with my posture, and um, maybe you could talk a little bit about why, why posture is, in Zazen, is, is, mm -hmm. is, is so um, uh, emphasized. In its yeah, practice. yeah. Well, there are many reasons. Uh, one reason is that, um, uh, you know, um, zazen is not, people sometimes think zazen is just being passive, but it's not just passivity. There's the, the passive aspect and the active aspect. So, and it's a balance between the passive aspect and the active aspect. So the passive aspect is just let everything come and let everything go. It come as it comes, and let it go as it goes, and accept whatever's there. The active part is to uh, take the position. And um, uh, so we have, a, you know, when you sit on the cushion, you have a triangle. The triangle is your knees, and you're behind, right? So, uh, and that's the firmest position. Uh, you could sit in a chair, you could lie down, you know, you could put your feet behind your neck, which is frowned upon. <laughs> but it's, it's that, that, that triangular seat, which is the most, the, the most immovable, immobile position, the, the best foundation, okay? You can't be easily pushed over. So you, that's, the, that's the foundation, and then you build the rest on that found, found, foundation. You build your, you actually have a building on that foundation. So to make the building sit up straight, you go, you keep the spine straight. And then you have um, uh, these things that hang off the body, like called the arms and shoulders. What are you going to do with them? <laughs> so you want everything to balance. You, you want the left side to balance with the right side. You want the front to balance with the back. So, uh, zazen uh, takes care of it. everything is included. Every part of the body is included. So, uh, you know, there's all these little joints of the fingers, the hand, and the, there are um, parts that are long and short called arms and legs and fingers. And they're all connected, but they're all independent. Right? Each one is like a puppet. You know, the puppet has all these, all these parts, but they're all connected by little circles. 
And then when you take, when you put a string on the puppet's head and hang it up, everything falls into place. So when you sit zazen, even though you're, you have this foundation, it's like there's a string pulling up your head, and that straightens everything out, and it pulls the head back so that it's not leaning forward, and it's alignment, total alignment. That's why I always push your back, lower back forward, because a, a straight back is not what a vertebrae is. A vertebrae goes like this, right? So it has that, in the lower back, it, it's forward. So to push that lower back forward gives you a nice seat, which doesn't strain your back, actually. And then you lift up your sternum, put your head on top of your spine, and then let go, you know, just hold this nicely. And, and you just keep doing this, stretching the waist and stretching your upper body. And that gives you the easiest sazen. You know, you, you get the f no problems that way. The more you get the problems is when, you know, your body's out of kilter, out of, out of balance, and you're using a lot, of, a lot of muscle to keep you in place. So there shouldn't be any, no, you know, it's like this, you know. When you think about it, you should be able to do this, because there's nothing, uh, no, no tension. There's tension, but there's not tenseness. Sometimes when I go to adjust people, somebody's posture, they're just like this, they're like a rock. I mean, how can anybody sit like that, you know? It's not, it's not, they're not allowing, there's too much presence, too much of them there. <laughs> so, by, by, by the acts of this posture, so I'll have to get, go back and do <laughs> So the other part of it is that the why posture is so important is because it affects you not only in your body but also affects you emotionally and affects you yes. how you feel about yourself. And exactly. Exactly. So right? yeah. So when you sit uh, this way, um, you're letting you're, you're is resuming your natural posture. It's not like you're taking some special posture. It's just that this is the natural posture. But what we talk, what we think of as natural posture, is the posture that we've this conditioned us, or the postures that we've assumed through conditioning. If you look at children, small babies, small children, you know, they have that posture. Their backs go like this, their, you know, and their tummies are going like this, you know, and they're, and they're all loose, right? But we become rigid through um, defense mechanisms. So that's why Zazen is letting go of all defense mechanisms. There's no um, uh, resistance, and there's no grasping. And you just uh, um, totally um, pure existence. That's what's so wonderful about Zazen. And the posture is the key to and then, you know, approaching that. Or, or, to, yeah, you know. everything comes out of that, right? So. Um, uh, that's why when you sit sashin, you know, you walk out the door and everything is, looks wonderful because that's the way it really is. <laughs> but because our mind is so clouded by stuff, we don't see it, right? Yeah, and our postures. So, you know, um, the, the physical, the, the physical um, posture affects the mind. Of course, we usually think of the mind as affecting everything, but the posture influences the mind. So we say, do you, when when you can't get the when you when you want to get the cart moving, do you whip the cart or the horse? Well, usually you whip the horse, right? Which is the mind. But in, in zazen, we whip the cart. <laughs> which is which is ta uh, the body affects the mind. <laughs> By taking the position, the mind becomes has clarity, has clarity. One of the, uh, since we're on Zazen a little bit, and, um, one of the controversial aspects of this is a, is a stick. Oh, yeah. Called the wake-up stick. Um, you used to use it, you still use it once in a while. Here. Yeah, we um, used to use it all the time. Talk about that a little bit. Suzuki always carried a stick. In Japan, they always carry a stick. Um, and he had a small stick, and he hit people twice on the shoulder. Everybody loved it. 
they're just wonderful. <laughs> and then, um, uh, it, it, we, the stick is, is uh, an aid, it's not a punishment. But, you know, some people uh, have said, well, you know, my father used to hit me with a stick, you know, and every time I hear that... But, you know, their father's not hitting him with a stick. It's, it's, that's not what's happening, you know. But, um, uh, and we always hit people only when they wanted it. Suzuki Roshi hit him anyway, but they, everybody, wanted him, everybody wanted him to hit them. But, <laughs> Why did they want him to hit him? Well, because it was like love, you know. It was like, <laughs> they want, it, it, hitting, it does, it's not something that hurts you. It's encouragement. It's not, a, it's not a punishment, it's an encouragement. In, the, in some of the Rinzai man, monasteries, they have a big step called a kaisaku. And it's really big and heavy, and, they, and the young monks just really beat each other up over it, you know. And that's become a kind of travesty, I think. But um, our, our um, uh, kiyosaku, I don't think it was ever like that. It was encouragement, and you know I call it the wake-up stick, but it's encouragement, and it does wake you up, and it wakes everybody else up when it's done right. So it's mostly the sound, you know. That's when you make a good sound, that then you, there's something real right about it, and everybody wakes up and feels clear. That's what happened to me when I first heard it. So yeah, me too. I thought. I, I, I don't want to hit the stick, but boy, that the sound of that woke me up. I thought, who's hitting the floor? Why are they hitting yeah, the floor? Why are they doing this? <laughs> okay. Um. But we don't do it anymore. We uh, there was a um, at Sen Center. They don't do it anymore. But we had a, a controversy here, and we decided that we would use it. We could use it, but we don't. Except I do use it during Sashin sometimes. And people appreciate it. They like it. As long as it's not overused. Not used in the wrong way. One of the things also in terms of Zazen is, um, I'd like to talk about a little bit about pain in terms of, because cause, um, yeah. this, this is a difficult practice, especially mm -hmm. initially, uh, especially for Western Westerners, I think. Um, right. The idea of sitting for 40 minutes, yep. not moving, yep. moving as little as possible. Yep. Um, I, I remember my first machine, I, I thought I was going to die. I mean, I just, I, I, I was praying for that bell to ring. My legs hurt so much, my knee, I mean, talk a little bit about, about... Well, my first sashin, uh, I left. What was that? You, you were probably hurting. Okay, go ahead. My sashin, per first sashin, I left. And I wandered around, and I went down to um, Aquatic Park in San Francisco. And I tried to find something to do. <laughs> There's nothing I can do. <laughs> I, I, I said, I realized, you know, that uh, I'm not in this world. I'm in that other world. <laughs> so I went back. And I remember Suzuki Roshi saying, oh, he came back. <laughs> Why did you leave? Well, I was just, I thought, God, you know, I can't stand any more of this. So when you first begin to sit, you know, um, it's very painful for most people. Some people it's not. You know, the, the, uh, there was a um, survey in Japan, and they found out that the people who have the easiest time sitting are 19-year-old uh, Japanese girls, women. <laughs> um, but everybody else has a really hard time, and even Japanese. People say, oh, well, you know, the Japanese are used to sitting on the floor and all that, but it's all the same. Um, but Zazen, um, you know, it, taking a new position, it's an extreme position for a, a pretty long period of time. Uh, your body's not used to that, so you have to become accustomed to it. And I remember Suzuki Roshi always saying, don't expect too much, you know. A little bit of progress is, is very good. Just a little bit at a time, you know. Don't expect a lot, you know. Just keep working at it, just keep going. A little bit at a time. And I, that was good advice. 
And, um, but even so, you know, sitting a long period of time and then sitting seven days, you know, it's, um, but, you know, Zazen is about the whole person. It's not just about the part that you like or the part that, <laughs> you, that you would like to have or, you know, your dream wish or something like that. It's about uh, um, riding on the road without tires sometimes, you know, or the sharks are eating your legs. I remember I used to think, now that here, here come the sharks <laughs> eating my legs. <laughs> but um, it's about how you, it's about non-duality. Zazen is about non-duality. It's not about preference. It's not about what you like or you don't like. And it's, uh, pain is, uh, what we call pain, is part of life. So we don't ignore that which is so integral to our life. Matter of fact, you know, Buddha says, life is pain. How do we deal with it, right? So it's, just, but it's suffering, didn't say it's pain, it's suffering. So how do we deal with it? How, how, how can you realize that pain is not necessarily suffering? Pain is just pain, and suffering is an extension of uh, um, uh, um, our, something that our mind creates over painfulness. So uh, I remember my teacher always saying, "Just be one with the pain." You know, if you create a, a if you create a, a, a split between your desire for something else and the pain, then it'll become suffering. But pain is just a sensation, just another sensation. And if you just allow that sensation to be there without discriminating, without trying to create something else or wishing it was not there or not liking it, then as long as, long as you don't like it, it'll be suffering. And even if you like it, it'll be suffering. <laughs> but, uh, it's just like, this is what's, this is this. This is this. So, to just see everything as it really is, not according to our subjective um, wish. As soon as you, as soon as you, you know, when you're having a zazen and you have this wonderful euphoric feeling, and you say, this is it, it starts to change. And then the more you want to, you grasp after it, the worse it gets, and then it turns into suffering. So grasping at things creates suffering, and um, um, aversion to things becomes suffering. So grasping and aversion are the two aspects that we're always dealing with 24 hours a day, what to take up and what to let go of, right, or resist. It's just, it's just constantly going on. So this, this is what our life is about. It's about, about what we like and what we don't like, grasping, rejecting. And Zazen is about the non-duality of grasping and rejecting, about the non-duality of pleasure and pain. It's like everything is simply what it is, and we allow it to be there. And if we don't have a resistance to it, or, you know, if we don't grasp, we become attached to the pain. I used to think, wow, that's an interesting concept. I think I was trying to resist the pain. He's telling me I'm attached to it. <laughs> well, yes, I'm attached to it. I attach through resistance. Because what I allow to dominate me is what controls me. So if we allow that to dominate, so... Uh, you know, and this is, we have to find it, nobody can tell us how to do this. We just have to sit there and, and figure it out. And you can't exactly figure it out either. You come up with all of the, you know, ideas you have about how to deal with it. None of them work. <laughs> you know, nothing, praying doesn't work, nothing works. The only thing that works is opening up and letting go. It's the only thing that works. And that's hard to do. You know, because our natural reaction is to resist invasion. You know, pain is invasive. 
So we resist it. That's the natural, that's our reaction. But you have to go the opposite direction. It's counterintuitive. You have to go the opposite direction, open up. It's a lot like childbirth. Childbirth's harder. But, <laughs> but it, 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 it's a lot like that. And I can remember, you know, when my wife was pregnant and dealing with the midwife, you know, and we were really in accord on that, you know, about letting go and just letting this thing happen. And the more you resist, the harder it gets. But whenever I'd say Sadzen is like childbirth, the women will always say, oh, no, it's not. <laughs> Well, there's three, you know, there's three legs to the kettle, the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha. So the Buddha, you know, there are many ways of talking about what is Buddha, right? But um, Buddha, in, the, in, in one sense, Buddha is the teacher. Everyone is Buddha, but in this sense, Buddha is the teacher. Dharma is the teaching. And Sangha are those people that do it, right? And uh, a practice such as this is really not easy to do by yourself. I mean, you know, who would sit down and sit for seven days without uncrossing their legs unless they had encouragement, right? So the Sangha, when, when you do it with other people, you, really, you know, that, just the osmosis of, of being together really is, is supportive for people. And the communication takes place on that uh, level of um, silence. A lot of communication takes place on that level of silence, you know, like everybody sits and like the end of the day, you know, like the last period of a seven-day session, everybody's sitting facing in, it's so powerful, you know, the, the, the atmosphere is just like, whew. and then, you, you know, there's something everybody understands, you know, without saying a word. And, um, then, you know, there's no need to even talk when you... I don't like to talk after Sashin. You know, I just like to go home, or, you know. Um, but there is that silent communication. Through practice itself, you know, there's that communication that's, that's uh, a lot, largely nonverbal. Well, in terms of Sashin, um, you know, what happens over, over a long period of time in terms of... Or why, why do... Um, why do you do sashims? Why, yeah. why, why is that an important part of this yeah. practice? Well, it's, um, you know, day-to-day -day practice is important to keep your practice going and to maintain a certain level of, a good level of um, awareness, you know. Uh, sashin is like um, intensifying zazen. Uh, so, like the first day of Sashin, you still have all this stuff going on in your mind that, you know, from your life. And then the second day, and then the third day. By the fourth day, even though there's stuff going on, you're just really just there. There's no other, there's no other world. <laughs> it's, just, it's just this. And uh, so it's total, it's like really total immersion. And um, it just gets deeper and deeper. So it's a really deep soak in reality. <laughs> um, People ask me, um, well, what, how should I approach Sashin, you know? And I say, don't even think about it. When the time comes, you just get up in the morning, you don't even think about it. You just go and sit down. And that's the attitude you have all the way through Sashin. You, know, you don't know what's coming next. You don't wish for anything next. You know, if you look and say, oh, seven days? Uh, yeah. No, it's just one moment after another. Then Sashin is just fine. Just one moment after another. If you look ahead, oh, when is the bell going to ring? You know, get into that. You, then you're already lost. You can get back on, but um, it's harder. One of the things we did today was a bodhisattva ceremony. Yes. 
and that's done once a month. Yes. Uh, why? What is the purpose of the bodhisattvas? Well, you know, it's, uh, traditionally, um, the monks have the upasata ceremony, which is by twice monthly ceremony of confession. You know, if some monk has done something, uh, this is in the Theravada tradition, then they then they confess it and then they have some result from that. Um, this is called an abbreviated um, confession. So it's not like we, you know, we, we talk about our our sins or whatever. We um, we simply acknowledge that um, the, our, our karma. We acknowledge it, but we don't say individually this is good or this is bad. We just say this is, you know, we acknowledge. And then we renew our intentions, renew our vow. So the first part is, is just acknowledging that that we've done a lot of stuff, you know, in the age, from time immemorial past to um, the present. And uh, we um, repent of that, whatever it is. And then we uh, renew our vow. So that's basically what it is. The term is shunyata. And we just we just um, uh, translated as emptiness, and there are attempts to translate it other ways, but emptiness seems to be okay, given that nothing's okay. <laughs> um, but when we think of empty, we think you know of uh, the opposite of fullness, right? But this emptiness uh, is not the opposite of fullness. This emptiness includes empty and full. So, you know, in in um, Zen. There's ordinary language and Buddhist language, but they use the same terms. So you have to understand it in a Buddhist way. So, you know, it's the cup. Even though the cup is full of water, it's still empty. What it's empty of is its own inherent nature. Because everything, there's no such thing as a thing. There's only a thing for a moment. So everything is continually changing, even though things look the same. Some things look the same longer than other things. <laughs> but uh, everything is changing, so there's no, no uh, strict form for anything. No, uh, ever, no lasting form. So everything is a part of everything else. And, and what gives the space for everything to change is called emptiness. There, in uh, Buddhism, there's 21 uh, meanings of the word emptiness. But for our purposes, I, I like to use the, the term uh, interdependence. Emptiness is another is a is a way of t talking about interdependence. So interdependent in an interdependent um, uh, universe, there's nothing that has its own inherent nature because everything is dependent on everything else for its structure, for its being. Nothing exists uh, isolated or by itself as an entity. So everything belongs to everything else. So uh, that's what we call, you know, um, uh, the Dharma Datu or big mind or whatever. <coughs> so when we say form is emptiness, uh, form, forms are the forms of emptiness. And emptiness, form is, um, and emptiness is the nature of forms. So if you try to grasp an emptiness, <laughs> there was a teacher, you know, who, who uh, talked about, asked his teacher about emptiness. And the teacher took his nose and said, there it is. <laughs> So we study emptiness through form. What brings people to practice is enlightenment. And so for Dogen, you know, enlightenment and practice are not two things. 
enlightenment um, uh, brings forth practice, and practice sustains enlightenment. But if you try to put your finger on, oh, this is enlightenment, then it's elusive, right? So you can't, you know, you can do it, um, but uh, you can be it, but you can't see it. If you try to peek at it, you know, oh, I want to see my enlightenment, you can't see it. But if you just do it, so it's like not self-conscious. It's, it's uh, you're, you're, you know, sincere. Uh, it's, it's bound up with your sincere effort and your ability to not get caught by things. The ability to not get caught in duality. So, there's another way of thinking about it, which I like to think about it, is that uh, enlightenment means bringing forth light, or allowing light to come forth. Since it's, that's the word, <laughs> enlightened, right, means the, the, the light's on, right? So, we all have our own light, but it's uh, obscured by, you know, um, uh, the clouds, like the sun is always there, even though it's a cloudy day, even though it's raining, storming, the sun is still there, and the moon is still there. The moon is a um, uh, metaphor for enlightenment, or, yeah, they use the moon a lot for enlightenment. Sometimes they say, the hazy moon of enlightenment. <laughs> um, one of the things that we did, we videotaped today was uh, eating Oreo cake. Oh, yeah. And um, why don't we eat? What is, it, what is in? We just why don't this for this chat. Okay. Um, Question is why do we eat Oreo? Why do we eat with Oreo? Yeah, why do we eat Oreo in the Zendo? And also, what is it about Oreo that's a lesson in, in mindfulness? Uh, yeah. Why is it the well, you know. way of eating a meal almost. Uh, so we can start with why do we, why do we eat Oreo? Yeah, I got the question. Yeah. Um, you know, originally, uh, monks had an, uh, one bowl, a robe and a bowl. So they would go around begging with the bowl before noon, and then eat their meal at noon, before noon, uh, or share their food, actually. Um, and uh, then at some point in Indian, in Buddhist time, um, they developed the Vihara, which was the place where the monks came to practice together. They were originally just, you know, loose band, wandering monks. And then they, they would wander um, during the year, and then in the monsoon season, they come together. And uh, so the, the, ro the bowl is, is still, of course, used, the begging bowl. And that's the basis of the Oriyoki, is the begging bowl. So the first bowl is the big, is the Oreo, the first bowl is the, uh, um, is the uh, Oriyoki bowl, which means uh, the bowl which holds just enough. Buddha's head, we call it. And then the other two bowls are extra. So I don't know where the other two bowls developed, either in China or Japan. I'm not sure where they developed, but uh, actually the, they had, the monks have, in Japan have five bowls. And they're all nested. You, you see my bowls, that they, I have five bowls that are all nested, but we, we don't use the other two bowls, we only use three. So now when we give uh, monks or, or priests um, Oriyoki bowls, we only give them three, because we don't use the other two. But even the, the, the first one, the, the um, Oriyoki bowl, sits on a little platform, uh, because the bottom is round. Um, so, um, the Japanese developed this um, way of eating, uh, with because they have a because of the, I'm not sure, it may have developed in China, but I'm not sure. But I know in Japan, this is the way it is. They developed this way of eating with the Oriyoki bowls, um, uh, because 
of the monastic practice. So, um, uh, and in, in India, you know, the monks were not allowed to work or dig in the ground or anything like that. So they didn't do a lot of physical stuff. And so they didn't need much to eat. They had one bowl. In China, the monks started to work. And so they had a second bowl, maybe a third bowl, I'm not sure. But they, they would eat more than one meal a day because they worked in the fields. And the Japanese developed three bowls, uh, breakfast, <laughs> or breakfast, lunch, and dinner. So dinner is, is considered a um, medicine. That's why we don't use the Buddha bowl when we eat dinner, because we just use the other two bowls. And it's just a kind of snack, you know. Uh, and so the Japanese monks are more energetic, and so they need more food, you know, is the rationale. So the bowl, they developed an, a, a nesting set of bowls. And the Japanese, being very ritualistic, developed this whole um, ritual of eating with the bowls. And, um, uh, you know, when we do eat, uh, we sit in zazen. So we're sitting in zazen, and then this is like the emptiness side, so to speak. And then the, the, the um, servers bring the food, which is the um, uh, mundane side. Food is uh, kind of, eating food is kind of a mundane activity. So um, uh, we meet that with our zazen. So zazen and mundane activity become one. And so this is, and, and this is such a, a wonderful, um, I don't want to say isolated, but kind of isolated activity that uh, you can really see how those two, the, the emptiness and form side, merge into one activity. So the, the eating, the food is, the, the quality of the food is recognized through your zazen practice, the, the, the essence of the food. And no matter what you eat in an uh, um, oyoki meal, it doesn't taste the same in ordinary meal. I don't know if you noticed that. It's not the same. You eat, you eat cereal ordinarily, and then when you eat it in an oyoki, it's just a whole different quality. It takes on a very different quality. So uh, you, you become more connected with the food and with the serving, and, and the whole thing becomes a uh, wonderful act of, you know, this mundane thing called eating. And it's just ordinary food, not something special at all. You know, plain ordinary food becomes, a kind of, has, takes on this wonderful quality. Oh, yeah. and, and I've often thought, and I, and I sort of wanted to just see about this, is that to me, in, in certain ways, um, Zen feels very subversive to me. Because mm -hmm. uh, our, you know, our, I, think I am getting off a little bit, but it's okay. our economic system is based on greed <laughs> and, um, uh, and delusion, I feel, the whole, and, and then hate always comes in there, I'm just looking at the war that we're having now. So. It seems to me that um, that um, people think look at zazen as being sort of passive, you know, yes. or you, know, right. you go and sit on the cushion and kind of bliss out. And, mm -hmm. and but I, I, I feel that um, that if you 
dedicate your life, not dedicate your life, but if you really do this wholeheartedly, it actually enlightens you. Yeah, and, and that's right. Not, in fact, it's, it doesn't have anything to do with blissing out. It becomes, no. you, you become even more, more alive to, yeah. and that's why it can be so painful, because you, you become aware of your, of your pain, of yeah. what you've been yeah. hiding. And so I just wanted to, maybe this might be the last question you can talk about, talk a, bit, a little bit about that kind of process in terms of, um, of um, going back to the, the sort of the blissfulness or the, or the closing down, and actually. It's just the opposite. And, um, yeah. and also the connection between this and the outside world, that we're not withdrawing from the outside world. Yeah. Well, uh, you know, in Japan, um, because uh, Japan is such a unified country <laughs> in so many ways, um, and um, because uh, during the you know the build up to the first Second World War um, was very totalitarian, you know, with the emperor and uh, the army and the navy and all that. That it was uh, it was very hard to dissent, you know. I mean, it was impossible, almost impossible, because you'd just be eliminated. Uh, so a lot of the um, uh, Buddhist establishment went along with the government. So I guess we would call that conservative, <laughs> but I, I don't know what to call it. But they did. Here, most of the people who are practicing Zen are liberal, mostly. And um, uh, for, for most of the people, you know, Buddhist practice and Zen practice is a kind of freedom. They understand the true meaning of freedom, you know, not just freedom to exploit, but, free, but actual freedom uh, from uh, greed, ill will, and delusion, you know. So uh, we get very upset if we have any awareness, right? Um, uh, I always feel energized myself by zazen. If you do it right, it's not just, as I mentioned before, it's not just a passive activity. It's a passive active, or actively passive, or pa passively active. <laughs> and um, that when you, uh, uh, it means that when you actually um, make an effort to do something, that uh, the calmness of zazen um, is a basis for the activity. So um, it's kind of like um, uh, if you have that calmness, you know, you, you, you have a place to, to expand and contract because you can always go back to zero and then go as far as you want the other way. But the zero is a basis. Um, also, you know, uh, in um, uh, Japan and various other countries, Buddhist countries in the past, Buddhism was sort of isolated from, um, purposely, uh, from uh, the government. In China, you know, the um, uh, at one point the Buddhists, I think it was in the Tang Dynasty, um, made this agreement with the government that they would not as long as they did certain things correctly, that they wouldn't be subject to government rule. They had their own thing. So uh, they didn't have to worry about, you know, uh, about what the government did because nobody could do much about that anyway without revolutions, right? But in America, and in Japan the same way, but in America, we have the vote. I mean, we're supposed to be able to, to have some say in how things go. And so we have a totally different kind of um, attitude toward government and, and toward the way things go. You know, Dogen says, don't get involved in government. Don't get involved in politics. Don't talk about it. You know, don't worry about it. Well, yeah, you know, we couldn't do much about it, right? And I can understand that. Sometimes I think, you know, if things get any worse, you know, I'm just going to go to the mountains, you know, and forget it, you know, and do something wonderful in the mountains. But um, 
we do have the the possibility of affecting things, you know. And I think that that we should not uh, let go of that. And I think sometimes there are people who practice who are laissez-faire about it. You think, well, you know, would, uh, Buddhism's not in, uh, connected to all that stuff, you know. But it is, you know, it affects us, I mean, and it affects everybody else. Even if it's not for ourselves, we should be doing, we should be doing what we feel is right for everybody else, right? Mm 